Well, it's common sense, isn't it? You feel a bit down, you go for a walk, you get out in the fresh air. It's not as common as you think, though, with doctors in different parts of the world having to prescribe mother nature for ailing patients. Ridiculously obvious, or could a bit of bird watching really solve chronic illness? Hello there, welcome to Roundtable. I'm Shuli Ghosh. Mindfulness, yoga, meditation, deep breathing. We all need to take a moment from our multiple devices and busy lives. In Scotland, they're taking nature more seriously and believe it could help people manage everything from diabetes to depression, even cancer. An apple a day keeps the doctor away, but how about the great outdoors? As the world's resistance to antibiotics grows and mental illness rates soar, some doctors are turning to Mother Nature for help. In Shetland, Scotland, doctors are prescribing walks in the countryside for a variety of illnesses. And in Montreal, Canada, practitioners can send patients to the museum for free to help with healing. Is this just a gimmick or could Mother Nature once again nurse us back to health? So let's introduce my guests today. Joining us on Skype from Helsinki in Finland is Professor Lisa Tarvainen, research professor at the Finnish Natural Resources Institute. Also on Skype from Shetland in Scotland is Karen McKelvey, RSPB Scotland, co-designer of Shetland's Nature Prescriptions Project. Here at the round table with me, I have Dr. Jacob Kronavski, the Green Walking Project Coordinator and Psychiatrist at the South London and Maudsley Foundation Trust and Rachel Stancliffe, Director of the Centre for Sustainable Healthcare. Um, welcome to all my guests today. Um, Karen, let me start with you because uh, I'm fascinated by the fact that the RSPB encourages nature-based prescriptions for patients. Tell us what that involves. Hi. Well, um, we thought we'd use the authority and um, of our most trusted health professionals to get the message across that nature really helps with all health conditions. Um, it's, it's natural that it will because we are animals and we are nature. And um, as a conservation organisation, we thought it'd be a really good way to get people connected back into nature and valuing nature more is if they have that connection through their health. So we've set up a leaflet that doctors can hand to a patient and we've got some activities, local activities and experiences that patients can uh, use on an online calendar kind of a thing. Yeah, I've, I've had a look at the calendar. Um, I should have had it with me here because I wanted to read some things out, but some of the activities are lovely. Uh, go out and take a walk, go and watch the otters, go and watch the birds, touch the sea and you have it month by month, um, which sounds great. But in terms of improving health, does it really work? Well, how will we know? As a conservation charity, I mean, we're just we're just looking for that hopeful connection that will be made, and then people will value nature. And um, it's it's now past the pilot stage, and the doctors we piloted it with really were keen that it rolled out across Shetland. So it's in all ten surgeries now, and um, we'll we'll just have to see what the feedback is from patients. But already we're hearing that it's been a lifeline for some people. That uh, it stopped one patient going off a long term sick when he was just about to feel like he was going down that route. And um, it just seems to be um, a nice way to engage people and particularly because it's local ideas and because it's experiences that people can literally step out their front door and, and get. And that can be the same in any part of the country. It just needs to be localised. Jacob, I, um, I see you, you nodding there. I mean, I, it, it, there has, we do sort of know about the link between good mental well-being and spending more time in the environment. Mm. Do you agree with that? Yeah, no, I think it's something that we've intuitively known for quite a long time, and you kind of look at the way that mental health was being delivered decades ago, and there seemed to be much more of a move towards integrating outdoor spaces within mental health care. But I think increasingly in the last uh, 20, 20 years or so that there's been an active effort on the part of sort of science and research to try to bring that link and understand that a bit better. So I think it's just about kind of marrying what we sort of know on an intuitive level to, I guess, what, what we're trying to get, what I guess, try to get the evidence from science as well. I, mean, I suppose in, a, in the simplest terms, um, it's about finding balance and, and maybe a step away from, from stresses of yeah, and, life. Yeah, and I think a lot of it has to do um, with sort of just 
understanding the importance of relationships and right. and I think perhaps you know we can go as sort of broad as talking about relationships to the natural world but also I think that these kind of activities also allow people to foster a lot of relationships amongst themselves within a group and I was I think I smiled at a point when we were talking about the community being happy about it um, the idea that it's something within themselves that they're seeing as being meaningful and I think that's, that's there's, a, there's a lot of value there uh, and I think that's presumably part of the reason that, that they're getting good feedback. And Rachel, this is something that's gaining a lot of cachet with GPs and with the health service. We're seeing more and more GPs giving out these what we call green prescriptions. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I mean, there has been a lot of um, there has been a lot of work over the last five years, I would say, around this, because, again, as we all know, you know, some people manage to get out themselves and get into nature regularly. Um, but because because of the stresses of modern life, um, and busy work schedules and so on, more and more people over the last sort of decades have become more isolated and also have taken less exercise. And because of, uh, you know, the connection, as um, you were saying, to, to the GP being, being one of the routes to health, then using the GP as a way of, of prescribing that may seem unnecessary, but actually because because of the way we are without that, then it, it is actually so necessary. What is it that GPs can prescribe? Give me an example of, of, of what so, they ask you to do. Uh, for, for, again, for decades, GPs have been prescribing physical activity, and that's one of the elements of, of uh, green prescriptions. Um, but those have typically been in a gym, so they've been in a local health centre or something, or le leisure centre. Which isn't quite the great outdoors. Which isn't the great outdoors. So, um, so what's, been, what's been changing more recently is um, prescribing physical activity, usually in a group, in, uh, in a green um, space, so in, an, in the natural environment. And that can be woods or it can be a local park and it can be anything from, you know, chopping down trees to laying paths uh, or doing some exercise in those spaces. Hopefully not chopping down too many trees. <laughs> <laughs> if you, if you the um, uh, Lisa, I know that uh, you and your team have been actually conducting studies into the benefits uh, of, of nature on healthcare. To tell us what you've been doing. Yes, uh, we've been working on this topic around 15 years now. But as uh, mentioned before, I'd say that uh, during the past five years, this uh, area research has expanded a lot internationally. And, and we have uh, much more uh, evidence now and, and knowledge uh, what are the health benefits of nature. Uh, we've been looking at the uh, associations of, of how people use and how often they use nature often here in Finland, it's, it's forested areas and, and uh, how, how, uh, uh, what is the availability of the nature and, and how that links to uh, perceived health or manifested health. We've done uh, large population surveys here in Finland, we started with that. Uh, we have done uh, on-site field experiments, we started uh, uh, about uh, eight years ago uh, research uh, project with a Japanese scientist who uh, scientists who have been studying health benefits of, of forests quite a long time, doing field experiments. Uh, what happens to a person when he or she goes outdoors and or goes to a, uh, or and a nice forest And what quantifiable area. results have you got? What are yes. you able to say yeah. is the actual concrete result? Yeah, it's the uh, that it's uh, you um, uh, when you go outside to, to nature, uh, you are able to recover from of, of, of stress quite fast. In our uh, field experiment here in Helsinki, already in 15 minutes in a nature area. Uh, you could uh, see clear results, even in a very big park, a constructed park, but even the, our, our big uh, central forest area here in Helsinki seem to be very effective in, in uh, reducing or decreasing stress. And, and you can, uh, we measure these effects on mental health, but also the physiological effects on, on blood pressure and heart rate variability and this type of things. So we can say that even short a short visit to, to forest or, or, or nature is, is beneficial. 
So, do, oh. so does that mean that uh, the people like Karen, for example, and Karen, you basically live in one big nature park uh, out in the, out in the in the Shetlands, um, are, because you have all that nature on your doorstep, are you guys intrinsically more healthy up there than the rest of us who live in in, in uh, urban London? Yeah, unfortunately not, because we live in the same society as everybody else does, and we have the same social pressures and. Um, perceived dangers out there in the outdoors that everybody else does in the UK. So largely the countryside in Shetland is blank. There's there's no people on it and uh, children and adults alike are indoors for the vast majority of their time and they're on screens or they're working at a desk, sedentary lifestyle as we know. So it, we just have the exact same problems and you know, I think I've been to London a lot recently and Walthamstow is just full of nature and there's massive marshes and all sorts of things. Even in inner cities, uh, you can find what you need, but you have to step out the front door. So it, it, you can you can see the connection between improving mental uh, health and being outside in the great outdoors. What about um, conditions and illnesses which have a, a physical um, illness, a, a disease, cancer, diabetes, think, that kind of the thing? The kinds that I think are easier to measure, perhaps. And um, you know, I think as we were talking about, and it's been referenced that, especially from Japan as well, I think that there's been an understanding that it has an impact on things like hypertension. Um, but, uh, you know, there is a connection between stress and physical health as well. Um, and so I think... Yeah, it... yeah definitely. I mean, I'm th so there are two main things that I understand, which are um, that your immunity can be uh, increased. So basically, when you go outdoors and you're less stressed, your immunity, le your, your levels of immunity mm. are increased, which then helps you to deal with other things and that happen to your body. about children, isn't it? The, yeah. the more children yeah. are out at a young yeah. age, the, mm. the, the better resistance yeah. they have. And then the other one is reduction of cortisol and inflammation. So again, with things like hypertension, but also can some cancers, the, inf the, the inflammation, which is then reduced if you're in nature, is actually a major part in some of these other um, more serious diseases like so I read this great study which um, said uh, with the with a children's hospital in Oakland uh, saying studies have shown that within 15 minutes of being in nature yeah. your stress level goes down your heart rate mm. improves your blood pressure improves so they, it does have quantifiable yeah. results. And then I think there's even more studies coming out, um, often which hark back to a study in the 80s where simply looking at a green space after a surgery would, would improve your recovery post postoperatively. Um, and then I think even more recently they're showing that um, following a, um, having like a major medical incident happen to you, having part of your recovery in a green space actually improves your rate and I guess quality of recovery. So I mean even going beyond measurable impacts like mm -hmm. hypertension and heart rate, you're seeing a general uh, I think improvement in physical well-being as well. And again, I think trying to untangle the you know how where the mental begins and the physical quote unquote stops, I think is quite difficult. Lisa, I can see that you want yeah. to, to to get in on that. Yeah, uh, we've been doing uh, this uh, year uh, review study together with the Medical Society, in the Finnish Medical Society, looking at making a critical view. What do we know in this area? So the outcome was that uh, the evidence base for healthy adults is, is quite strong already. So we are talking about public health benefits, uh, preventive uh, effects of, of using nature actively. In Finland, people uh, use, use nature traditionally quite a lot, but in urban areas, it's not self-evident anymore to have these areas around you. So we, uh, we have to take this into account in urban planning. But for, sickness, for the recovery from sicknesses, there's rather little uh, scientific evidence still. We have uh, some uh, research, but a little bit mixed uh, out, uh, outcomes, mixed results. But but uh, but uh, and we have a rather little uh, really well conducted uh, controlled and experiments. Lisa, is this something do you think that governments will pick up more on? I mean, is is there a commitment in Finland, for example, to look more into this kind of green? Yes, def definitely. I, I would say that uh, these benefits are increasingly recognised in the Finnish society. If we talk about forest policy. It's in the, it's written there that uh, forests produce health benefits. Uh, parks and wildlife. Uh, fee, uh, uh, Finland, the state forest agency, has a, as one of the key uh, strategies is to produce health benefits for 
populations, also other sectors are more and more involved in this this area, and when we have a pilots uh, that we we test how nature assisted therapies or uh, to to different kind of patients could work. For example, we have an example here nearby Helsinki. Uh, Sipo municipality has taken type two diabetes patients and uh, to to regular nature walks uh, as part of their everyday treatment and they, it's a routine uh, treatment now for them in this uh, healthcare centre. Karen, can I ask you, um, because you, you mentioned that doctors in, in 10 GP surgeries across the island uh, are going to be authorised to prescribe things such as the, uh, the nature walks, which the RSPB is, is taking part in. Is there a general acceptance um, that, th that this is going to play, these kind of things are going to play a bigger role in healthcare? Or do, are you still coming across sort of some scepticism? There's there's scepticism amongst GPs until I go along and I'm trying to visit each surgery one by one and talk to GPs and, and until I get them to think about their own connection with nature. Hmm. And GPs as a group of people are really quick to use the outdoors and to use nature to benefit their own health and well-being. I think there was one study that said 42% of GPs would use exercise i'm not sure if it was exercise in the outdoors to combat depression if they felt depressed depressed whereas five percent of them would recommend the same to a patient so it's trying to encourage doctors to look at the evidence to that's just burgeoning there's so much evidence out there now that nature helps physical and mental health but it's uh, yeah there's some resistance until they realize oh yeah it really helps me i should be trying to find that that personal link that people have to nature because if they can they've got that relationship with their patients their family doctors and they can sit with a patient and try and find out what it is that does it for them you know it might be walking a dog it might be um turning over a rock or um drawing in the outdoors or journaling their nature idea or do something really dramatically physical but yeah that there's yeah. some resistance still because they don't understand the evidence base i think it's maybe not in so much their training as, as it mm. could be and maybe it's a little bit a cultural uh, thing mm. also mm. Uh, people uh, like here in the north europe we have a quite a good connection or strong connection to nature and we are used to use nature and mm. and uh, it's uh, for, right. for many people have experienced it uh, personally so maybe that there are get different the experiences benefits. in different parts of the world i mean do you guys yeah. find that and there's then, a, a yeah. bit of skepticism over the benefits i mean i, I mean not being from from the uk i mean, I, I think my loads of open air in, in canada that's yeah we do have lots of open air in canada but i think you know one of the things coming in living here is that i think there's a real sense of people being connected to to sort of the natural parts of the uk and so i think that there's a real appetite for it and it's just about how we're going to frame it um, but I really think that I'm well. I'm really encouraged that people will 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 want it. But do you think GPs might be a little bit reluctant because it might feel like a cop out to them or a way of I dealing with with having massive waiting lists and being mm. under pressure and then you prescribe mm. a walk and question. people might think that it's, that is a yeah a it's easy option. I, I I agree um, that some I think some GPs have had this perception that they would do different things for their patients than they would want for themselves, which is really interesting. Hmm. But the, I mean, the thing about it being an, an easy option or a quick fix is absolutely uh, not the case. It's the opposite. So basically, when you, when you have a green prescription or a social prescription, and green prescriptions are part of that, um, you will, the, the whole point is that you're no longer giving somebody a very quick pill mm -hmm which might fix the symptoms of something, but you're actually more interested in the underlying causes. So a green prescription or a social prescription will typically be not with the GP, not given by the GP themselves, but the GP will refer you to a dedicated person, worker, who is connected with the GP, who is like a mixture of a counsellor and a citizens advice bureau type person, who will then work with you as an individual to understand right. what can help you in the longer term. So some of the underlying causes of your symptoms might then be, be dealt and, uh, with. I suppose this all goes towards this idea that we should try where we can to move away from the medicalisation 
Yeah, I mean, and I think it's, we, we were sort of this mention of, of a change in culture, um, and we were talking about this before we, we came in here, but I think my view is that we're kind of reaching the boundaries of, of what are sort of easy fixes. And I think mm -hmm. there seems a sense that things like mental health and well-being generally are really complicated ideas. And I mean, social prescribing is very much, I think, I'm really encouraged by it because it seems to be a movement towards this idea that, you know, health isn't just about clinical care from delivered by a medical model, but our health is very much represented between, you know, by our relationships, by our communities. And social prescribing feels like a really, um, I mean, I think the fact that it's being, uh, there's such an uptake in it, I think is a really encouraging sign but, about. I mean, do you think that, th that there, there's been an increase in, in mental health problems because of the way we live today because there's a you know a, we're, we're all on social media we're all mm. on devices we we seem to spend a lot of time talking to each other via via our mm -hmm. smartphones but not actually interacting in a physical sense I, I mean I sort of thinking about coming here today I was reflecting on there's a the famous study from Harvard which looked at the long, looking at um, people over the course of 70 years and they said that the as, as I can recall the number one thing that came out of it the people who were had a sense of well-being in their 70s and 80s talked about having important relationships in their lives uh, and those being valuable relationships that they could depend on. So, I mean, I think there's something about urban centers which kind of creates a bit of distance sort of paradoxically. Um, yeah. But, you know, looking at what people talk about, I mean, we're essentially, we, we need relationships to stay healthy uh, and that's how we define our well-being. So I think it's about taking that seriously. So do you, uh, um, my ladies in, in, in Scotland and in Finland, do you see this as becoming uh, a bigger part of healthcare in the future? Yeah. Yeah. I, I would say that, sorry, <laughs> in Finland uh, there's been already a quite big change in attitudes. I was speaking last week uh, in the seminar or conference for, for medical doctors first time uh, here in, here in Finland uh, to, ex to talk about these health benefits of nature but it, it goes gradually when we we, uh, we need this uh, more solid uh, evidence base regarding uh, sicknesses more more research that would help the, the doctors uh, be more involved, but there is already, a, I think, a big attitudinal change. And if we go to Asia, for example, to Japan, they have much more holistic approach to uh, to health. Mm. Uh, working with them and and this cooperation in in research, they have no such boundaries what what we have here in the Western countries. So I think, uh, uh, and people people are, are very much interested in this, and it's been a very popular topic in, in Finnish media for the past two, three years. Yeah, that's one, one so of the things which, which the community slightly disagrees about um, internally, the sort of green prescribing community, if you like, is the need or not for more evidence. So, mm. you know, a lot of us would say ideally yes, but actually there is so much out there already. Yeah. And there is, it's like we don't do studies on do you need a parachute or not? You know, there's that thing about right. where is evidence actually valuable? Well, I suppose when it comes to, I mean, we know that the government is investing four and a half million in this yeah. social prescribing in, in schemes across uh, England, like walking clubs and gardening and arts activities. And I suppose when it comes to cash, yeah. People like to see that there is... Uh, yeah, but we're spending patterns. six billion a year on, on treating right. obesity, which is from, you know, basically caused by sedentary lifestyles. Yes, they're not walking. So a billion, mm -hmm. not million. So in a sense, you know, we are doing a tiny amount to put back into some things which are intuitively sensible and complete no-brainers, which do not have bad side effects yeah. when we're already, yeah. you know, we're already far, far over spending that amount in treating mm -hmm. um, things like diabetes and obesity, which we know are caused by lack of physical activity. Right. And I think there's a sort of sense that we're trying yeah. to look for what the magic bullet is in nature. Like, why, what is it about nature that, that, you know, gives us a sense of well-being? But again, these are, I think, you know, the the impact on, on ourselves is going to be really complicated and to try to find that one thing that's making the difference I think is, is, is going to really... I mean, we know some things like um, we've long known that being by the seaside mm. uh, because, uh, makes you feel better because there are, I think, is it negative ions that mm. are around which, which actually have a, 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 an impact on, on your sense of well-being. So, I mean, but as we say, we don't have to prove it, do we? We just have to know that it does have an mm. effect. Yeah, I think in some sense, sort of trust what people are saying in a, in a sense as well. But as, as Rachel was saying, there is a lot of evidence there already. Right. And, uh, and the public awareness, raising public awareness is one thing. 
uh, important thing about the benefits because in the in urban societies many people maybe have lost this knowledge mm -hmm. and when we put more uh, uh, focus on preventive medicine to to prevent people from getting sick rather than and treating when they are really sick that's expensive right so then nature gets much more emphasis and role and it's 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 worth economically also make sense to to integrate it into social and health care mm -hmm. uh, Karen, services. What, what did you want to say? Yeah, well, I was just saying that uh, my experience of doctors and speaking to them, that they're really jittery about not having the evidence base. I mean, that's where they've been trained to the hilt at the moment. Anyway, they really want that evidence base. And if they don't have it, then they really struggle with themselves. I, I personally yeah. think that's about culture change, mm. not about yeah. the evidence. I mean, if you talk to somebody at a CCG, a clinical commissioning group, who might commission this or something else for people, um, they will say that a lot of what they're doing at the moment is also not evidence-based, but it's just how it's always been well, done. We're obviously gaining a lot of <laughs> anecdotal evidence from people yeah. like yourself uh, and Jacob and, and, and Lisa in Finland. So uh, hopefully uh, there'll be many more schemes like uh, Karen's uh, RSPB scheme. Um, guys, thank you very much indeed for joining me. Um, really great discussion. Good to have you with me. Uh, that's it for this edition of Roundtable. Until next time, bye-bye. <laughs>